In the bleak waters of the North Atlantic, a salvage team prepares its submarine for an historic dive. Soon the sub will begin its two and a half mile descent to the most famous wreck in history, the Titanic. The team plan to explore the ruined liner, investigate this giant hole, and recover some of her lost treasures. Expedition leader, American George Tullock, is determined to uncover the Titanic's remaining secrets. The Azores, July 1994. The expedition has chartered the French research ship, Nadir. On board is one of the few vessels that can reach the wreck, the submersible Nautil. Ahead lies a five-day voyage to the final resting place of the most famous ship since Noah's Ark. Nadir is bound for a rendezvous with the Titanic, a ship that left Southampton 82 years ago on her one and only voyage. The Titanic was then the largest and most prestigious ship afloat. At her helm was Captain Edward J. Smith. He already had a problem, as the official inquiries later revealed. Deep within his ship, a fire was burning in a coal bunker. The embarking passengers were not told this alarming news. Also due to sail was the American money baron, J.P. Morgan, owner of the White Star Line and its flagship. Shortly before departure, he changed his mind and had his baggage and art collection taken off the ship. Bruce Ismay, the White Star Line chairman and Captain Smith's employer, was on board. Both men must have known about the fire. I want to know what was driving the mind of these men. You had a fire on board your ship and you were worried. It was out of control. That's a fact. And you were lighting boilers. You were trying to burn up coal and get rid of coal and get this fire problem resolved. My feelings are that that fire was a driving force that made you go faster. It's my opinion that that fire was a driving force that caused friction on board that ship. I mean, which is better, to hit ice or, or, or to burn up? I mean, what do you want us to do here? So the Titanic set sail for its date with destiny. This summer's expedition may find out more about why she sank when they bring to the surface relics of her historic voyage. Much will depend on the French crew. They are experienced underwater explorers. Some of them were involved in the discovery of the wreck in 1985. George Tullock feels strongly about the Titanic. The wreck still has the power to affect people, even a tough submariner like Commander Nargelet. There is a strange sentiment on the bottom near the Titanic, even in the debris field when we are far from the, the bow or from the stern, there is a strange uh, sentiment, you know. It's very strange. Now, if we put them on the deck, please, so they don't fall off. The international team that George has assembled makes its final preparations. Every one of the objects they recover, however ordinary, will be precious. So remove this box, put it outside. Dick Barton is in charge of security. It's Rhonda Wozniak's job to conserve the artifacts once they're out of the sea. And to see everything's done properly, there's an expert from the National Maritime Museum, Dr. Eric Kentley. My role here is essentially as an eyewitness. The whole museum community is concerned that these objects are kept together in a secure way, that they're brought up responsibly, that they're adequately documented, adequately conserved and ultimately go on a public show. And to interpret the past, the expedition has its own historical advisor, Klaus Joran Wetterholm. What went down with that ship was the belief in, in a secure society. 
what went down that night was of course all this luxury and what was realized was that uh, uh, a millionaire died side by side with an, uh, a fireman and this was a terrible blow to the, the upper Edwardian society. This is where the Titanic sank, 500 miles off the Newfoundland coast on the night of April the 15th, 1912. More than 1,500 lives were lost. La distance? La distance, 10 meters. I wouldn't have done better. I have two GPS. No, I have one in the The echo sounder reveals the wreck on the seabed. That is the bow section. This is the position that the Titanic sank. Um, the ship is below here, of course. There can be a, a slight variation from the angle and, and the, the location on the bottom of where she sank. P.H., would you say that pretty much, though, this is the site that she was yeah. at when she sank? Mm -hmm. So this is it. This is it. 70 meters, 7-0. A sonar buoy marks the exact position of the wreck. OK, on y va, mouillez le lest, puis ensuite la balise. OK, must be. Okay. What we're doing now is putting down the transponder. This gives us the acoustic transmission qualities that we need on the bottom of the ocean so that we know not only down below with the submarine, but up on board here with the Nadir, where the submarine is at all times. The submersible Nautil is at the cutting edge of submarine technology. It can dive to depths of 18,000 feet almost four miles down. It also has a remote controlled camera called Robin, which can explore the areas where the sub cannot go. But first, Nortil must have a test dive. We'll get a chance to test the, uh, the uh, acoustic location devices, get the transponders to tell us everything's working fine. We'll also get a chance to uh, get the drift that Nautil will take as she drops down on the wreck. By getting that drift, we'll now be able to launch the baskets, the recovery baskets, and get everything set up for tomorrow. Tomorrow, if this test dive goes well, the Nautil will explore the wreck. It's extremely dangerous. Um, matter of fact, it's um, it's it's dangerous just to be out in the fantail here with the equipment of launching the submersible. And of course, the danger is really once you drop below that surface, the pressure drops all the way down to 6,000 pounds per square inch. The real danger is uh, for those three men because you're talking life and death danger. The pressures the Nautil has to withstand are equivalent to those beneath the space shuttle's engines at blast off. How long will it take him to run here to do the calibration? I think it's uh, maybe 40 minutes or something like that. When, uh, when they're here, we'll drop the basket in yes. this area? No, we drop here. Okay, and Nautil will run to yes. it? Yes, but when the basket is uh, near the bottom. You know. As the dive begins, Klaus Uren's thoughts turn to the passengers who were saved and the trauma they suffered. All those who survived the disaster and had memories. They, they have had nightmares, they've gone through horrible ne memories because of this. Beatrice Sandstrom, who is the last survivor in Sweden today, her mother had nightmares at old age. She dreamt about the Titanic every night, she could hear the screams.
The dive went fabulously well. We haven't had our debriefing yet, so we'll get with you as soon as we've got that done. Patrice, we're going to close that up, okay? All ships have their traditions. The Nautil is no exception. <laughs> first Nautil dive, so he's initiated into the noble art of being allowed to dive the Nautil again. Welcome to the club. Un bon succès, c'est très machine. bien. On a même trouvé le, le fond. La machine, ça marche bien. La machine marche bien. Le, tout marche bien. Tout va bien. <laughs> The engineers work through the night, checking and rechecking the systems, fine-tuning the submersible for tomorrow's dive to the Titanic. Jan Uar will be on the first dive. Oxygen, 190 bar. Oh, c'est bon, post. Extension. La suspension, il n'a pas terminé. We know that the sphere is okay, and uh, you know it's very, very safe, in fact. And we don't think about nightmare. We don't think about danger. The pressure is so high that. Uh, if, for any reason, the sub had to collapse, it should be very, very quick, half a second or something, but we, 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 we couldn't see anything. But we know that this, this wouldn't arrive, this wouldn't happen. Not for sure. It was a long night, but uh, now everything should be ready. We, we're ready to go. Do you think the sub's fit now? I mean, are we going to have, have any equipment problem? I mean, you guys had me worried last night and this morning. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, it's you know, we did always we like, could. <laughs> always it like that uh, before each dive. We hope everything is okay. I think the most important thing is just to get us the best pictures you can uh, for the public and also if you can come from the seabed up on that hole on the starboard side so the researchers can really have a, a yeah. good look at that. A dive on the Nautil demands skill and stamina for the three crew cramped in a cabin seven feet across. The descent alone takes two hours. Then they will spend eight hours exploring the wreck before finally making the two-hour return journey back to the top. Oui, bien reçu. Est-ce qu'à votre avis, ça correspond au morceau de tôle retourné? Est-ce que vous voyez les quilles anti-roulis de la coque, à vous Ok, reçu, tu me rappelles, terminé. Two and a half miles down, there emerges from the gloom an awesome sight. The bow of the most famous wreck in the world. The Titanic landed upright on the seabed.
Much of her superstructure was ripped off as the ship sank at ever-increasing speed. Experts had thought that the Titanic would still be in good condition at these oxygen-less depths, but the ship has lost most of its wood. She is slowly dissolving on the ocean floor. She seems to have broken in two as she sank. The two halves lie 800 yards apart. The ocean floor in between is littered with the debris of the sunken liner. At the stern are the vast engines, each the size of a four-story house. The propellers are 27 feet across. Images of the wreck below fuel arguments above. Did the coal fire play a part in the sinking? Was it still burning when they struck the iceberg? Eyewitness testimony at the time conflicted. His colleagues may disagree, but George Tullock is convinced that the coal fire did contribute to the disaster. I do know that I've talked to many ship's captains that say many ships of the turn of the century, coal fire um, powered, sank because of, of problems with coal, had numerous fires because of problems with coal. When you got a ship that's got bunkers 30 feet high and a bad lot of coal flush on it, and I just think it's irresponsible to let that ship leave with, with a fire you don't have control of. There was no coal fire after the 13th of April. All the coal was used. And also a coal fire uh, was quite, I wouldn't say usual, but it was not uncommon on the coal-fired ships. The argument here is that uh, a, the ship run, was running too fast, B, because they wanted to reach New York, C, because they had to get rid of this coal fire there, and D, this coal fire, or the coal, caused an explosion and made the ship to sink. Coal fires did occur on steamships because of poor storage. Usually, the crew solved the problem by feeding the burning coal straight into the furnaces. But on the Titanic, as passengers relaxed, unawares, on the upper decks, below, men were still fighting the fire in the immense number six bunker around the clock. If the fire was still burning when she hit the iceberg, might it have resulted in an explosion and caused the hole in her side? The truth is, Glass Shorn, that we do have at least third uh, party testimony that says that there that their experience was being a stoker on the Titanic, that an explosion in the coal gases occurred and, um, and contributed to the Titanic sinking. The Nautil surfaces after her 12-hour trip. Scuba divers now begin the complex recovery operation. The sub has come up well clear of the ship in case of collision. On the surface, Nautil is helpless, drifting without control in the Atlantic current. She relies on the Nadir and its team of divers to lift her to safety.
even the greed is so beautiful. What do you think you feel like when you know what the people are going to say when they see that? Back on board, Jan Ua shares with the rest of the team the excitement of the artifacts the crew filmed. There you are. Look, because it's not square down there, it's rounded. I was a bit surprised to see the, the sort of hinges at the ends. Yeah, it looks just right. like it. Yeah. It when you, saw it's, it's, you know, it's too much. Yeah, it's it's, it's, you when it's you first saw it. <laughs> so beautiful. It was like something looking over the top of the box. Oh, it's too late now, but, you know, it was so beautiful. Take Macy's in New York and just shake it and turn it upside down. And turn it into a, hospi a, a hotel yeah. and a hospital and restaurants and a department store and turn it upside down. Yeah. And they are. Plus the people. Plus the people. Yeah. Now it's time to start recovering the artifacts. What we've got here is syntactic foam. Uh, syntactic foam is a series of glass beads compressed together in a very dense way. And without this material, which Nautil uses totally encasing itself, its sphere, and, and these items will be used to actually recover the baskets, it would be much more difficult to recover anything from deep ocean. These specially adapted baskets will bring up the artifacts from the seabed. This all. Ah oui, oui, je te dis OK pour le principal en avant. When you go out and in it's your turn to get in the submersible, do you have a serious think with yourself and it happens hours beforehand. So this is it, huh? You, you know, you're not tethered. Nothing is connecting you back to the real world. Uh, there are not uh, a fleet of these submersibles that can come rescue you. It's, um, it's goodbye time if uh, there's a real problem. You'll freeze to death before you'll run out of oxygen. If you really think about all the problems that go wrong, um, they'd have to push you down into the sub. Watch your head. George's company, RMS Titanic, fought a long legal battle for the rights to salvage the wreck. It's an expensive venture. One dive like this costs around $100,000. They hope to get their money back by mounting an international exhibition of the best of the Titanic's treasures. So every trip to the ocean floor is vital to the venture's success. The Nautil has two remote-controlled arms to pick up the artifacts on the seabed. They're manipulated by the pilot, who also controls the submarine. The Nautil will not penetrate the wreck, but confine its search to the field of debris. Today, George is observer. He'll choose what to pick up in this seabed. Lucky dip. You know, when there's two and a half miles of, of water, solid water over your head, you're in a teal, um, working in slow motion, and you know it's costing you five dollars a second. Five dollars a second, that sharpens your concentration. I mean, that is real pressure. Our dream is a floating museum that will be able to visit every port and show the world these titanic objects in the proper environment. 
it's this very collection of objects that we want to hand forward to the generations ahead. When you see the entire collection, you start to really understand the personal as well as the maritime tragedy of Titanic. It's time to surface and examine George's Hall. I'm glad to be home. It was uh, long and it was cold. Oh. And it was exciting. You know, when you stumble upon a rich area like this, that's such a, it's like a salad, you know, it's like a tossed salad. But you find these gorgeous pieces just in amongst the wreckage. You could see the four screws sticking out of the, of the hinges. And you just knew that this piece in exhibition, the people would love this piece. Because you can see people looking through it. it, it it's, it's Titanic, you know? It's Titanic. And you, you know, your impulse is, this is just... I didn't call him, please. Same flight, Marcel? Right. The same Red. company, Stonier? Right. Stonier, same uh, Cunard and uh, American Line and uh, French Line, same for uh, the plate egg. So you were on the SS France? Yes. very delicate sherry glass. Gramonier bottle. Small and possibly cosmetic oil. Some plates with a trademark from Holland. And then in this corner here, a jar of olives. It's an interesting mixture, isn't it? Of material from the actual ship itself with the white star logos and smaller things that are obviously people's personal possessions so it tells both sides of the story the magnificence of the ship and something about the lives of the people who were probably emigrating with their prize pieces to put on mantelpieces in the new homes they never arrived at and one of them has a pattern of a building on it what does a painting show it's a it's a building and I'm, i can't quite make out the inscription and then we've got a hot water bottle, which is very nice. We haven't seen this before. Um, ceramic bowls with a green marbleized glaze. There's been criticism of the company for salvaging objects from the Titanic, even accusations of grave robbing. But the team believes these artifacts are historically important and should be saved before the sea destroys them. George strongly rejects the accusations. I'll tell you who's a grave robber. The people who robbed people like Stanley Lord, Captain Stanley Lord on the California, people like Captain E.J. Smith of his reputation, these are people who robbed the graves. These are people who took dead people who had no ability to defend themselves and turned around in their time during their grieving period and robbed them of their reputation. Those are grave robbers. And this is interesting because if you compare this one 
with the other one, there is no date under beneath. There's, under the gold ones, they have date. They are I date think that if you want to get uh, in close contact or have a good connection with history, you don't only read about it. You need artifacts. That goes for every museum in the world. Uh, you need this three-dimensional insight into the history. <laughs> very good. Very good well, very nice. Uh, in the big basket, we have uh, something very nice. I think uh, class will be very happy to find something good. We're going to have a little lobster. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is fabulous. Every time we find something in Norway, yeah. in copper, in perfect condition. And the waste pump is yes. the finest I've seen. It was. So you're saying I mean, the, iron the waste pump, pump was it on, on a tub. So you're Debbie. saying that the, the, the metal pipes actually help the binocular stabilize. Yes. The, yes. the night the Titanic sank, the lookout in the crow's nest had no binoculars. They'd been locked away and the key was missing. The lookout survived. He said that if he had had binoculars, he would have seen the iceberg in time for the ship to avoid it. <laughs> this is a girl who works in France. <laughs> Are these the binoculars that could have saved the Titanic? And she works in France. To come across these is just such an enlightenment and such, such a wonder. It's, it's really wonderful. For two lucky weeks of good weather, the team dived every day, recovering all sorts of objects from the Titanic. They're the biggest bring and buy stall you've ever seen in your life. It's quite magnificent, it's fantastic. Just equipment, pieces of uh, everyday um, hotel wear, kitchen wear, everything you'd want in your life is there. We couldn't or didn't have to work any further than the 20 meter radius around the basket because there's enough coal there. We've got over 300 kilograms of coal today. The coal could make a handy contribution to the company's finances. They've stated that they will not sell the artifacts, but a souvenir lump of titanic coal could fetch thousands of dollars. For George, this coal has a greater significance. The Titanic on an average day brought 600 ton of coal through the boilers. So you can imagine the number of men needed to break down these pieces of coal and feed those furnaces was just incredible. And they did it day after day after day. That black gang had had such an incredible job, such a tough job, that that the shipping companies were just thrilled when 1920 came and they could run these ships in and switch over to oil. <laughs> So what exactly was happening up on the bridge as the Titanic steamed into the night? What's known is that iceberg alerts were piling up in the wireless room. Without comment, Captain Smith handed his chairman, Bruce Ismay, a telegram warning of icebergs ahead. Was this his way of politely telling his employer to slow down? Was Ismay overruling his captain? The fact that Captain Smith gave him the telegram indicates clearly that Captain Smith was trying to say to Bruce Ismay, slow down. And my concern folks, is that back in Washington, where we had an American inquiry and found Captain Smith negligent of neglect and, 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 and failing to heed the advice of others, we found him guilty of crimes. Captain Smith 
was going to retire, as you know, and he didn't have so much to lose if he had told Bruce Ismay that I'm going to slow this trip down. Let me tell you what a man who's about to retire has to lose. His retirement. Everything he lived for. He had a 12-year-old daughter. He had a lovely wife. He didn't even want to take this journey. You and I know it. He wanted to walk off the Olympic yeah, right into retirement. He was told, you've got to take one more ride. Why? Because we've got to get these people taken care of. We're late. We're late. Yeah, that's true. Uh, just like the Mad Hatter. If it were horizontal, I think, yes. rather than vertical, yeah, I think it would slide through that lip. Is this one Before the expedition one ends, one George wants to recover a large piece of the ship, a reminder of the immensity of the Titanic. The problem is how to bring to the surface a piece weighing several tons. Straight steel. A steel, a steel cable here, yes. Right. Ten millimeters steel cable. Okay. It's more difficult for the set because with a cable, it's like that with a... If the uh, object they've the chosen the is one of the Titanic's the bollards, in, which were big enough to hold the cables securing the giant ship to the dockside. The Nortil crew worked through the night, devising a way to lift a bollard that could weigh at least two tons. We are trying to, to have two solutions. One, uh, one normal solution with, with, the, with the iron line. And if it doesn't work, we have to imagine uh, another solution for these small holes. What are you actually trying to say with this piece? Are you trying to say something about the construction of the Titanic? Or are you actually trying to say something about the wreck? If it speaks of the wreck as it is today, it doesn't doesn't mean that it's not accepted. I think we ought to look at the piece and see what kind of a voice it has, so to speak, and make a decision then. But you see, we can't get the old ship back. We have the wreck. I, I think you're right, yeah. Glashar. And so I you have I, to have a combination then. Well, then I think we've got to let the good Lord help us a little bit with what we pick up. The crew drop huge flotation bags filled with the ship's fuel to the seabed. They hope they will provide enough lift to raise the bollard. Well, it was hard uh, to, to get it uh, collared, but we've got it, and she's coming home. And uh, so everybody look forward to the fact that, uh, that that's what you'll get to, to actually feel when you, when you get a chance to touch it. That'll be titanic to you. It, it's titanic to us. Hey, Bernard, I think it's heavier than we thought. Maybe a little bit than more than two times, maybe. You are going to with the boots or with the No, for the fish to Ah, yes, yes. Let's go. Let's go. Let's The bollard weighs three tons. It will be the centerpiece of the exhibition. George has good reason to celebrate on this, his 50th birthday. So far, the expedition has been a success. George made his money through a car dealership in New England. When he read that the Titanic had been discovered, he simply thought salvaging its artifacts might make an exciting business venture. Since then, the company has spent $13 million on the project. Will it be possible one day to recover objects from inside the Titanic? 
Could the answers to what happened on the night of the disaster lie within the wreck? George wants to look inside. I mean, I know we've never, we've never been down in here, PH, uh, and, and I know we don't know what we're going to run into, but I mean, these are some of the nicest rooms man ever created, and if we can get in there and get any memories that are there, I mean, this is our job. We've never done here before. And uh, we can find like in the hatch, for example, big piece of food or something like that. And we cannot go inside because it would be very dangerous for the no-till, uh, for, for the, the robin. But uh, even for the no-till, if the robin is, uh, is uh, trapped in the ship, you know, we never so deep inside the ship itself. The technology doesn't exist to actually re make a recovery of anything. Uh, is it actually worth the risk? The real concern here is that as an archaeological site, as a picture into the 1912 life at this international level, not just first class, but this is all we can do at this point because of our accessibility. If there's something in here that would add to the ages, it's worth a peek now to get the, the technical information to make those decisions on. We, we can't make them just on gas and on bravado. We've got to make them on scientific data. Commander Nagele, the most experienced of the divers, has the task of exploring inside the Titanic. The run of good weather is coming to an end. Gales are brewing. Tu es parti à ou tu, tu es largement dépassé là Tu arrives à, à reculer un peu Tu sais de reculer un peu si tu peux pour... Robin, the remotely operated camera, sets off on its exploration deep inside the wreck. Oh, qu'est-ce que c'est beau ça Tu as les images, tu aujourd'hui Suitcases lie slowly disintegrating in the baggage room. Tu penses à quoi là, Guy? It's a beautiful day. Day, Ah là, il y a des vues fabuleuses dans la vidéo. Hein. Grills similar to these were to keep third-class passengers below decks, while first-class passengers boarded lifeboats. We are very near from the Captain Smith's room. You see the tub? Maybe five or six meters. Là, on est à même pas un mètre. One meter. Oh, we can touch. Yes, but... Uh, it's a little bit. Yes, yes. Captain Smith's bath has weathered well. The Titanic's survivors owe their lives to this Marconi radio, which transmitted the first ever SOS. Robin descends the five-story grand staircase the finest any ship has ever seen. The hanging chandeliers are the only reminder of its former magnificence. The lower part of the Titanic's hull is buried in silt, so any gash caused by an iceberg has never been seen. 
But on the starboard bow is the enormous hole that George believes may have been caused by a coal fire explosion. Here's a hole. The hole starts, you know. We discovered this hole in uh, 87. It's strange because this hole is from the inside to outside. This hole is very big. Probably we can put the nautil inside. It's so big. This hole is very strong. Any explosion on the ship uh, pulls the metal from the inside to the outside. But it looks like, but we don't know if it's an explosion. But it looks like. Tu es près de la cassure, là? In my opinion, there is three possibilities. The first is that the iceberg did it. The second that a fire call or an explosion did it. And the first is that the bottom of the ocean did it when the ship hit on the bottom. And uh, now I think that this uh, hole was made when the ship hit the bottom. Here at the bottom, when the ship arrived like that, with a very high speed, the ship is like that. Commander Nargelet offers George a quick sketch to explain the mystery hole. He thinks the impact of 46,000 tons of steel and wood hitting the seabed ruptured the hull and created the enormous triangular gash visible today. Here, at this level, is open like that. If it's a collision, if people say the, the, the damage came when the ship hit down, then why isn't it on the port side as well? You know what I mean? Yes, but uh, in port side there is something a little bit smaller, but there is no hole. Even if the hole was not made by a coal fire explosion, George is still convinced that the fire did contribute to the disaster. Did Ismay ignore the iceberg warnings so the ship could quickly reach New York, where the fire could be put out? What secrets does the Titanic still hold? The liner's owner, J.P. Morgan, had his personal records of the ship destroyed. He died within a year of the disaster. Bruce Ismay rode away from the sinking ship. It was to haunt him for the rest of his life. Everybody knows that Bruce Ismay uh, was the chairman of the board, and he was on board, and he was saying to the chief of engineering, light these two boilers, light these five boilers. He knew about that ice at one o'clock. He was lighting boilers. It was his ship, or it was J.P. Morgan's ship. It used to be his company, and he was the boss. Captain Smith went down with his ship and was officially blamed for the disaster. Captain Smith deserves better than we've given him. He knew they were going too fast. He knew the disaster lurked ahead of them. And, and when it happened, Captain Smith was the last person that was surprised. He was the first person who expected it. And when it was there, he did the best he could do in that horrible situation. I think we can know what happened to the Titanic, if we want to know. I think our work is all that will tell you. How else could you know what happened to the Titanic than by uh, examining the Titanic? Um, all the books and words in the world aren't going to do any good for you if you don't come here. The artifacts recovered will go on show around the world. But for the time being, the Titanic has not yielded up all her secrets. <laughs>